This is Ralph Rensler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Good afternoon. Welcome to Coffee Break, Community, Conservation, Culture, part of Beyond the Mall from the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. We are offering real-time captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for today's program. To view the simulcast that includes these services, please use the link provided in the comments section. My name is Rebecca Fenton, and I am co-curator with my colleague Michelle Bambling of the United Arab Emirates program here at the Folklife Festival. Today, we're inviting you to join us for a coffee break. Let's take a pause to learn more about something that many of us around the world drink every day. But we don't all drink it in the same manner and we may not know much about its whole journey. Our festival theme is cultural knowledge in the environment. So with this conversation, um, we're opening up a discussion that will continue over the next year. And tea drinkers, we haven't forgotten about you. Even people who take decaf are welcome here today. This cross program brings together the festival's Earth Optimism and United Arab Emirates programs. Earth Optimism is produced by the Smithsonian Conservation Commons in partnership with the Folklife Festival and is coordinated by Betty Belenis and Arlene Reiniger. The UAE program is supported by the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, the UAE Ministry of Culture and Knowledge Development, and the UAE Embassy in Washington. Now, if you don't know the festival, I encourage you to check out our website, festival.si.edu, and follow us on Instagram too. Now, I'd like to welcome our guests. From Bogota, Colombia, we have Oswaldo Acevedo and Angela Maria Ortiz of Cafe Mesa de los Santos Coffee Growers, who are certified with the Smithsonian's Bird Friendly Coffee Initiative. From the United Arab Emirates, we also welcome Safiya al Maskari, who is a manager at Lest We Forget, an arts and culture initiative there, and Amna Khalid al Meheri, a student in the Arab Crossroads program at NYU Abu Dhabi. Welcome everyone, it's so nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as we talk, we'll be taking your questions and comments in the live chat. So please join in, tell us where you're tuning in from and tell us how you like to take your coffee. Please feel free to ask questions and comment in your language and we'll do our best to address them. So I'd like to begin by asking each of our participants to tell us in turn what coffee means to them. So let's begin with Oswaldo. What does coffee mean to you? Thank you very much to the Smithsonian and to the United Arab Emirates and everybody putting together this program. Thank you very much again. Coffee means a lot to us and particularly for our country because for 200 years or more, that's been one of our main sources of income for our, these 50 million people country, Colombia. Uh, one thing very important is that at the beginning we got our fame of for, for, for good coffee by growing our coffees under protecting shade trees. But then the Green Revolution came in in the 60s and then basically most of the shade trees were removed to try to become more productive. But then on the 80s and 90s, we understood that that's not the right way to go and we're going back to where we were before. So that's exactly where our farm stays today. We are a shade-grown farm complying with the requirements of the Smithsonian. 
which, which means more than 10 species of shade trees. And that gave us the seal bear friendly coffee. Okay, bear, friendly, bear friendly coffee is very, very important because that means restoring and reforestating our world one coffee at a time. Thanks. Angela, what about you? When you hear coffee, what do you think? Thank you so much for your invitation. Okay, um, coffee means to me uh, opportunity of the best part of the day, of the each day. But before, coffee works for me, but now coffee works for nature and for me. That's great. So Thank you. The meaning for me. Sophia, what about you? Uh, coffee, when you say the word coffee, it reminds me of the scent and the taste of Arabic coffee in particular, and of all the nostalgic memories that come through my mind, the conversations that uh, I engaged with my family and our home majlis while drinking coffee. So that's what coffee is to me. Thanks, and Amna? Well, it's very hard to just describe it in one sentence, but to me, coffee is the aroma of family gatherings. And I guess I can say it's a bridge to social relationships. Mm, that's lovely, thank you. I'll say too, for me, coffee, um, it's something that I associate with my parents who drink coffee sort of continuously, um, but it's also now, I just make it for myself in the morning and it's a really, it's a nice quiet part of my day that I value. Thanks for that. So during this conversation, um, we are gonna move first from the farm and then to the cup. So I'll ask Oswaldo to continue telling us about his farming operations, and then we'll travel about 8,000 miles from Colombia to the UAE as we turn to Amna and Safia to tell us about the deep traditions of coffee in their home country. And then we'll continue the conversation together to discuss changes to these traditions and to take your questions too. And uh, we'll have a few videos and photos to enjoy along the way. So back to you, Oswaldo. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your coffee growing operation and how you uh, became interested in the bird friendly certification? Okay, our, our farm is conformed now by 300 hectares of coffee covered by a forest of 60,000 shade trees, compound of 50 plus species of shade trees, 156 certified bird species living in the farm. And uh, aside of that, bees and bats and, you know, all nature is finding a habitat inside our farm. So that's the, the basic structure we have today and our message is to encourage all coffee drinkers, particularly in the United Arab Emirates, to consider drinking shade coffees and bird-friendly coffees, because that's the way to go to restore our, our nature for the future. That's great. Can we see some of those photos from the farm? Great. I'll quickly describe this image. It's a grid of four photos. On the top, we see two beautiful brightly colored birds, red and yellow, and below uh, similar red and yellow colored um, plant berries. Oswaldo, what are we looking at? We're looking at Arabica coffee beans in the red and then deviation to yellow in the same Colombia coffee normally grown here. And this is a contrast with uh, the color birds with bean colors varieties. So it's the same species of birds. The uh, red one is female and yellow is male, the Purangas. That's great. So these are um, what we call them in English, uh, tanagers. And uh, many of the birds um, that find their habitat on the coffee farm are also migratory birds. So um, bird people in North America might actually recognize some of them. Um, so uh, the, the birds as well as the coffee beans are a way that perhaps surprisingly, um, Colombia is connected with other regions in the world. Exactly. Okay. And tell us more about um, the process of growing the beans and harvesting them, please. Well, it's basically selecting the right variety of coffee in accordance with the ambience we have. So it's the, the combination of the seed and the environment. 
that provides the best flavor possible for one coffee bean. And then we go ahead and plant those particular seeds. And then that coffee tree has a, a life of seven years, two years growing up from seedling to, to mature, and then is removed and changed for the same varietal time after time. And every three cycles of seven years each, we remove the shade trees because they become old. They have already served their purpose. And then we replant again both the coffee seeds and the shade trees. And this is an image that illustrates what it is. The coffee is in, in, the, in the bottom line. And then the shade trees are above that to filter excess of sunlight and also to make the coffee growing slow and also to provide with the leaves falling into the ground some mulch for the nutrition of the coffee trees. That's great, thank you. So this is a drawing that represents um, kind of the full ecosystem of the bird friendly coffee with the tall trees providing shade, uh, the middle height trees such as fruit trees and the coffee growing low to the ground at the bottom. Thank you for that. We also have a video that shows some footage and describes a Cafe Mesa de los Santos. Shall we put that on? This is the field where your next cup of coffee grows. This is your daily cup of coffee contributing to conservation. The new way of drinking coffee is bird-friendly Habitat Coffee Mesa de los Santos, and it is certified by the Smithsonian Institute. This is the future of coffee, but you can drink it now. Order now on Amazon.com and contribute to restore nature one cup at a time. Thank you. So can we see the photo uh, that shows the three different colors of coffee berries? Thank you. So this is an image that shows um, in the background this very verdant um, uh, uh, farm with the coffee plants. A woman is gesturing at a table with coffee in three different colors spread out, red, orange, and yellow. So Oswaldo and Angela, can you tell us about the different varietals that you grow and also about um, what it is that we're seeing here? Because those of us who buy coffee in a supermarket might be surprised that it's so uh, colorful and really looks like a beautiful fruit. So what, what are we seeing here? What we're seeing here is the, the red, the yellow and the pink. And the pink is, is not very usual. In this case, it is from a varietal called Wush Wush from Ethiopia. Very nice flavor and very good uh, desire from the consumers that value something very unique and a flavor very sweet. So these are, are the basic three colors of the fruit. But once the coffee goes into the shelf of the supermarket or whatever, the restaurant, then these colors do not show any longer. So we have to explain that by photographs or by text that tells the consumer what was the original color of the fruit and what is he going to drink now? And she's Yolanda, the good mother of varietals at the coffee garden in Hacienda Roble coffee farm. Thank you. Um, Oswaldo, at the start of our conversation, you mentioned um, the Green Revolution. I read in preparing for this conversation that Colombia is attempting to make all of its coffee growing sustainable by 2027. So is bird friendly something that um, is increasing in Colombia in awareness? Or how is your work part of that move towards sustainability? Well, there is the willingness to increase it, but this is basically a subject of demand of coffee. So if consumers basically in the world begin to demand more bird-friendly coffee, the response here in this country will be immediate because we coffee growers like to grow coffee on the shade, but we cannot take the extra cost of productivity going down so we need to have the consumers willing to pay a little bit more so we can sustain the thing and begin to plant more and more shade. So that's what we call the, the, the bird-friendly seal, the reforesting of the world, one coffee at a time. Great, thank you. We have a question from a viewer on YouTube. Deborah asks, why must the shade trees and coffee plants be replanted every seven years? The coffee trees need to be replanted every seven years because at the seventh year, it begins to decline in production. So it has already served the cycle and needs to be replanted again. But the shade trees, 
they are re replaced every 21 years. So for three cycles of coffee, one cycle of shade trees, because the same, if the shade trees go uh, beyond 21 years, they begin to die, they begin to fall, and then we need to replant again. And once we replant again, they are more, you know, um, carbon se sequestration, uh, important thing, and they release more oxygen to the, to the atmosphere. So that's the right cycle to go for the environment. Thank you for that. I'm so struck by the very long-term planning and investment that you must make um, to get all the aspects of this farm ecosystem working well together. Um, coffee, for those who don't know, coffee is one of the most traded commodities in the world. It's a huge business. And one of the things that is quite incredible about it is that about three quarters of the world's coffee comes from small farmers. Um, perhaps 25 million farming families all around the world. Yeah. Um, and on the consumption side, despite um, the Starbucks of the world, much of what we know and like about this beverage comes through the family as well. Before I move on from this topic, I wanna to just point out that this is an image of um, the Cafe Mesa de los Santos um, packaging showing their specialty varieties and the beautiful illustrations of some of the bird species um, that find their habitat on the farm. So now I'm gonna turn to Amna and ask her to introduce us to the Emirati coffee tradition and its cultural significance. So Amna, please share. Yes, so coffee is one of the most important traditions of hospitality, not only in the Arab community, but uh, specifically in the Emirati society as well as it being a symbol of generosity. Arabic coffee has been an essential part of Arab culture for many centuries, and the way it is prepared and presented is characterized by accurate traditions and rituals. And to say how it's very culturally significant in the community, um, when I conducted the interviews with my grandmother and mother to get more information, she kept repeating this quatrain from a poem that really represents the cultural significance of coffee um, and the Arabic coffee. Um, before reading the uh, quatrain, I would like to say that the poet's name um, is unknown because it is a very, very old poem um, and it has been passed down uh, by the word of mouth to the next generations. Um, so I will begin now by reading it in Arabic um, and later the translation in English. Um, the Arabic translation. Yelgahua betshara uyach. Lo yistui mennach b'ashreen. Khataftu len rim tiglach. Mazin sabbach fil fanayil. And now I will read the English translation. O oh, coffee, I will quarrel with you. If your mana reached 20. I passed as Reem roasts you. Oh, how beautiful you are when poured in the cups. And to further explain how the cultural significance is represented uh, in this poem, in the poem, the poet says, oh, coffee, I will quarrel with you if your mana reaches 20. Mana is an old weighing unit where one mana equals four kilograms. And 20 dirhams for this quantity of coffee in the past was quite expensive. And so the poet here says, even if the price of the coffee went high, I would still buy you because you are very important to me. <laughs> and other than that, a very interesting fact I've uh, got from my grandmother. She says that when you, when you have coffee in the house, it's very important, not only because the people in the house enjoy drinking it, but also because they used to use the coffee powder as a treatment to stop the wounds from bleeding. So I think that's a very interesting fact, yeah. That is really interesting, thanks Amma. I mean, that coffee has more than one kind of value in the Emirati yeah. family is fascinating, thanks. Yes, exactly. Um, so you conducted a research project um, during which you learned about the traditional process of making the coffee. Do you wanna tell us about that? Yes, of course. It is a very long process, of, uh, different from what people nowadays do in their homes. So the process of converting coffee beans into powder starts begins with several steps. 
not only with uh, roasting it, but starts with sorting out the coffee beans, washing them, drying them, and beginning with roasting them. So to roast the coffee beans, a specific pan is used, as we can see here in the picture. This is my grandmother's coffee bean roasting pan, and in Arabic it is called the tawa or migla, that has a beautiful rustic golden color. It is a small round shaped pan that has a long handle and comes with a long turner or spatula used to flip the beans. And an emphasis I would like to make on the size of it. It is small because in the past they prepared coffee only in small quantities to prevent the coffee from losing its aroma and keeping it fresh. And after roasting the beans, they begin to crush and pound it. To do so, they use a mortar and pestle, and it is called the minhaz in Arabic. And usually its material is stainless steel, as we can see here in the picture. This is also a utensil I got from my grandmother. The mortar has a hollow shape to hold the, in the beans as they are crushed, while the pestle is a heavy and blunt club-shaped object and they keep pounding the beans until they are formed into a fine and smooth coffee powder. And now moving on to the most important part of the process of preparing the coffee, which is uh, when they pour the water in the coffee and later adding the um, coffee powder. So now I would like to show you an object. Um, it is the della, uh, the coffee pot. We call it della in Arabic. Um, so here, as you can see it in my hand, it is the traditional coffee pot. It, it kind of have like an hour shape, uh, hour shape that has a handle and a narrow long opening for pouring the cup, uh, for pouring the coffee. And when they prepare the coffee, around one liter of water is added to the coffee pot. And usually in the past, they did not have spoons. So to measure the coffee powder, they used to use the, the small coffee cups. And I have one right here to show you. This is a coffee cup. This is like a modern design. Um, and so they would add two, uh, I mean, one of these coffee powder, one and a half of these um, for the coffee powder. And then it is left to boil for around 10 to 15 minutes on the hot burning charcoal. And later the coffee is ready to serve. However, I would like to say also that they, uh, people like in the Arab world, they add flavors to it, such as saffron, cardamom, mm -hmm. rose water, and cloves. But not everyone prefer to add it while it's boiling. Some people prefer to add it to the serving uh, coffee pots. So would it be correct to say that every person or every family has their own way that they like to make it with the flavors? Yes, exactly. So every family does have a preference. So I would say that my family does not do does not use uh, rose water or cloves, but we do use uh, saffron and cardamom. So it depends on the family. It depends on their preferences. It depends also, I guess, on the area that they're living in. Great. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Safia now. Safia, first, will you tell us how you like to take your coffee? Do you take saffron? Do you take cardamom? Uh, yes, I like it with saffron, with cardamom, and sometimes with rose water. It depends on my mood. Great. Thanks, Safia. I'd like you to tell us about Lest We Forget, first of all, um, and then tell us a little bit about what engagements Lest We Forget has had with coffee and the culture of coffee. Yeah, sure. Uh, Lest We Forget is a uh, grassroots initiative that documents and explores cultural memory pertaining to the UAE. Uh, we pursue scholarly and artistic endeavors, uh, archiving family photographs, um, vernacular objects, uh, curating exhibitions, collecting oral memories from the older people, um, producing uh, products uh, and uh, films. And uh, one of the one of the first exhibitions we had was called uh, Emirati Family Photographs, and it came with a publication. And we collected uh, over 200 photographs from Emirati families. And uh, it was wonderful to see the different pictures from these families. And one of the photographs that we received was from a Emirati family. And it was of a young girl standing in their home majlis. And behind her is the pillow that's uh, normally seen in uh, 
the majlis and it's placed on the floor because usually uh, in uh, majlises the uh, back before and uh, some some houses today uh, the seating is on the floor not like how uh, it is today in in modern days uh, so this uh, pillow behind the girl is a white pillow with uh, a red motif in the center and in the four corners of the pillow it's a medium to a large size pillow i would say and uh, we really like this photograph so i decided to uh, design a modern uh, style of uh, pillow. It's uh, smaller in size, not something that you would typically see in a majlis, but it's a modern take to the traditional design. And uh, it has the same design on it, which is the red motif uh, in the center and in the four corners. It's much smaller in size. It's something that's contemporary. So it's, it's interesting to see that we take an old design and then implement it in a, in a new way. Uh, so these are. this is one of the projects that we designed for that exhibition. And uh, one important element or one thing that you would always see in a majlis or always have in a majlis is coffee, of course, uh, Arabic coffee. So we thought uh, what would be nicer than designing a coffee cup with the same motif that's on the pillow uh, on the coffee cup. So a more uh, modern uh, coffee cup, I would say. And uh, a lot of people who saw these uh, saw the pillow and saw the co saw the coffee cup were uh, were uh, they were interested because they said that they also had the same uh, pillow in their majlises uh, in their homes before and how this brought back a lot of memories. So it's interesting to see how people uh, see things and then they remember their their old photographs or they remember their old uh, old memories of their family. Thank you. That's such a great anecdote, and it really expresses what lest we forget does and the importance of its work. Some viewers mm -hmm. may not know that the UAE is a quite young country. It's just about fifty years old, and I think. Um, Lest We Forget is such a beautiful initiative that responds to um, a desire people have in that place to understand their history, to document it before it's forgotten. Um, and I think it, it's really wonderful to see how these um, elements of nostalgia um, help connect people, you know, not only to their own family histories, but to a common experience in the UAE. Thank you for that. To roll back just a little bit, please tell us what is a majlis? Oh, yes, I forgot to mention. So yes. a majlis is a very important part of Emirati families' homes. Uh, usually there's two styles of majlises. Uh, one majlis would be indoors or a more private majlis where the members of the, of the house or the family would meet uh, regularly. They would spend most of the time during the day in it. They would have their coffee. They would engage in different conversations. Uh, and then there's another type of majlis, which is uh, nowadays outdoors. Uh, that uh, p friends of the family would meet. So it's a more uh, something that people from outside can come into and they could have conversations and sit comfortably. So uh, this is what a majlis is. And it's a very important part in Emirati families' homes. Thank you, Safiya. So next I want to um, ask everyone to talk about uh, contemporary culture of coffee. Before we do that, um, we're going to play a short video that was made by a member of our UAE festival team um, that shows how coffee is made in a contemporary kitchen in an everyday manner. Um, so we're going to queue up that video and um, viewers, the video has several quick panning shots. So if that's something that you're sensitive to, um, please take a few seconds and look away. Thanks. Today, I will show you how I do my Arabian coffee. First, I need the coffee. And of course, heated water. Fill it all the way up. Five spoons of coffee. Leave this for eight minutes. We put just a little bit of saffron.
and just about two drops of rose water. And then we wait. Okay, now that the eight minutes are done, I'm gonna first check the color, not too dark, not too light. And we want to filter or put the strainer so the actual coffee doesn't go inside the cup or uh, most importantly we do not shake it never just leave it like this for about two to three minutes until it's ready And the coffee is ready to serve. Great. I wanted to include that video in part because um, I thought some people might see, for example, the beautiful utensils that Amna shared with us and think, oh, mortar and pestle, that's not for me. But you can see that coffee, um, Arabic coffee, traditional coffee is really a part of everyday life in the Emirates today. Amna, is there anything that you saw in that video that you want to uh, draw our attention to, such as the grind of the coffee or the color of the beverage? Yeah, I would say what we saw in the video is quite different from what um, people used to do in the past. So it used to take long, a longer time to prepare the coffee and they used to do it like um, instantly when the when the guest comes to their house they used to prepare the coffee directly and does not leave they don't keep it in the coffee pot for a mm. long period of times but um, as we saw in the video uh, the uh, the man poured it in the uh, coffee pot and this coffee pot stays for a very long time which makes the maybe makes the coffee lose its aroma and that was not acceptable in the past so a lot has changed now. Um, I think the video shows us how uh, coffee preparing copes more with the modern conveniences of life. Um, but before, um, maybe these things were not available. Great, thank you. Sophia, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, it is different. I would say, uh, looking at that video, I would say that in our homes, we do it differently. And it's interesting mm. to see how different families, different homes now do their coffee differently. And uh, you can tell that this home has the specific ingredients they add or, or the coffee is maybe stronger or lighter. Uh, for example, our coffee is darker. It's uh, much uh, heavier. So it's nice to see the difference in uh, the, the way people make prepare their coffee these days great and is there a certain um food or snack that also goes with this coffee usually dates yes has to be dates, dates, right? yeah. they pair uh, perfectly together dates and coffee yeah, yeah because the coffee is not usually sweetened is that right yes no, yeah so the date it's give it a little different. bit of a sweet companion thing exactly. um we have a question from Karen. This particular coffee is very lightly roasted. Can you elaborate on that? And I'll also ask Oswaldo after this to talk about uh, roasting of coffee. So Amna Safiya, the light coffee, it starts with green, fresh coffee beans. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I would say like the roasting of the coffee beans is what changes the color of the coffee. Um, and I guess it depends on the people's preferences. If they want it to be too dark, they can roast it more. If they want it to be a light, they can roast it less. And also it depends on the pounding, if they want it to be fine or, um, yeah, it depends on the, uh, how do they do it, yeah. So people have to be quite knowledgeable <laughs> about the process mm -hmm. in order to yes. prepare it in the traditional manner. That's fascinating. So Oswaldo and Angela, can you tell us about that beautiful machine that we see behind you and about your roasting? Yeah, this is a two and a half kilo coffee roaster. Very precise, very fine art, very fine work. 
And uh, what we do with this machine is take all our varietals and try to do a very, very professional roasting and then grinding to try to obtain the best flavor from every varietal of the coffee. So do you produce some coffees that you roast darkly, some coffees that you roast lightly, depending on the varietal? And the, no, basically depending also, uh, after we analyze the varietal, we go to the, see the consumer, what he's looking for. And then we try to match what we have to the consumer. That's what we call the, the matching from the coffee and the consumer. That's the main thing to, to please the consumer. Because for instance, in the Arabic world of coffee, coffee is usually dark because they like a strong coffee. And in other countries, like in Japan, dark is made more medium. Mm. When it's in more medium, there are different flavors, and where it's dark, there are other flavors. So we have to adapt to each market in the way we roast the coffee. And where you live in Colombia, what's the typical uh, coffee flavor that people seek out there? Well, two, two, very, two very important things. Coffee professionals like acidity very much. Coffee consumers like sweetness very much. So mm. uh, we, we'd rather go to the consumer than to the professional. So sure. we try to produce <laughs> our curve is as sweet as we can. That's great. So um, Oswaldo and Angela, um, Amna and Sophia have described the munchless as well as the in-home consumption um, for the coffee. What's the typical setting where you live in Colombia where people drink coffee together? Is it a coffee shop? Is it inside the home? Coffee shops are on the grow now not as not as, as important as in other countries in the world. So it's basically a home consumption and important segment growing in the out, out of the home consumption. Great, thank you. I just wanted to underline that coffee in so many settings really fuels conversation. I think uh, for Americans, maybe we forget that because nowadays a coffee shop experience can be very isolated. We have our headphones on, it's in and it's out. Um, but I hope that through this conversation, um, we're really experiencing how coffee and other beverages um, are a, a point of connection for people. Um, I wanted to get to um, a point of debate, uh, which is coffee versus tea. Um, for those who are not coffee drinkers, I want to note that we have posted a recipe for karak, which is a kind of chai tea that's common in the Emirates today. And you can find that link in the chat. Um, we'll also be preparing some information on how to make Arabic coffee that we'll share with you um, later on. But let's hear from anybody. Is there different times of day or different places where you prefer coffee over tea? Sophia, what about you? Um, I would say mornings are more for coffee and afternoons and uh, evenings I would I would take my tea but that's me personally of course mm -hmm. it, uh, it depends from person to person but if uh, you were to ask a person of uh, older age I think they would always prefer coffee than karak. Uh, karak is not uh, something that they typically the older people would drink they would definitely choose coffee over tea. Wow. Yeah. Amna what about you? Um, I agree with Sofia, but uh, to me, I agree with older people. I love coffee more than Karak. <laughs> um, yeah, coffee over Karak. <laughs> okay. That's great. Oswaldo and Angela, I hope you like hearing these responses that coffee is preferred. Um, I wanted to ask you all to talk about what you think is the best method of preparation for your coffee. We have a photo of a, a coffee setup that you shared with us. Can we see that one? In this photograph, we have a man standing behind a table that has a lot of different kinds of equipment on it. And he's holding a, a shiny stainless steel kettle with a long slender spout. Um, can you all tell us what, uh, what kind of coffee preparation method we see here? Explica. <laughs> Uh, we, we're doing this uh, preparation, which is uh, the filter for pouring coffee. And uh, we have a frame that holds three, uh, what we call true brews. And then we prepare the coffee slowly 
and we it takes about four minutes just before we serve that into the table. So that's what the image is showing here. Because we consider that the best way that we can uh, find difference between different varietals is slow coffee. So it's pullover coffee, similar to V60 system of, of filter. Mm. This is actually how I prepare it at home. So this is very gratifying for me. Mm -hmm. So what you said is that this no. uh, way of also, preparation is, is, put in the photo. Uh, is the the best way to taste the differences in the different Same varieties. Way. Yeah. We have a question from social media, which is, is the, is the coffee that Mesa de los Santos sells as whole beans or is it ground? Can you tell us about the grinding? What? We sell them both in accordance with the order we receive from the customer. Great. Um, I think that, um, thank you so much for sharing all these details. It's really enriching. As I said at the top, you know, coffee is an everyday thing for me, and it's been really rewarding to learn uh, so much more about these different aspects of its growth and its preparation. Um, I think that anyone who loves coffee can help to improve the health of the earth, the income of farmers and their connections with those around them by making changes in our habits. Um, we have a question from the chat on this point from Juan. What can we do to compensate farmers better as many times they make just enough to keep their farms operational? Uh, Oswaldo and Angela, do you have any comment on that? Well, that, that's a very long time issue being discussed for many, many years, but, you know, it's basically a supply and demand, so it's very difficult to intervene and create something artificial to try to recompensate better the, the farmers. But it's very, it's very important here that the bird-friendly coffee is a seal that the consumer recognizes and buys that coffee. If he does that, he's paying a little premium on the pound of the coffee, and part of that money is going to go to the farmer to compensate for the shade he's planting. So that is, is another advantage of the bird friendly seal that not only you can restore the habitat, but you can really compensate, compensate better the coffee farmer. Great, thank you. On the side of cultural aspects of sustainability, Amna and Safia, do you wanna say quickly, I mean, both of you spoke about learning about coffee through going through families or family photographs. Do you have any thoughts on um, how uh, viewers can better understand the, the cultural connections in their everyday culinary traditions or speak about the research that you did? Yes, so um, I agree that um, the coffee serving or the preparation is taught to the generations um, by their families um, because you can't find a lot of resources online. And, and that's what I did for my research. I went to my grandmother and mother to interview them and get, get information from them. Um, and yes, it is an intergenerational one. Yeah. Right. Sophia, any thoughts on that? The cultural, uh, uh, sustaining the cultural values of coffee? Um, I think it's really important, especially uh, uh, what Lest You Forget does is we we try to preserve those, uh, the culture, we try to keep the ways and the traditions of how the older generation uh, do their coffee. So it doesn't fade away as time, time passes. And the older generation is slowly, um, going and uh, i don't want to put it but i mean like we uh, it's uh, for us the younger generation to take and to preserve and to sustain it uh, i think uh, that's the best that we can do right now okay thank you i'm going to start to wrap up the conversation thank you so much to our guest speakers oswaldo aceveda angela maria ortiz amna khalid Almeheri, sofia almaskari thank you so much for being with us today thank you does anybody have any final thoughts, closing words that they want to get in? Just uh, thank again the Smithsonian and the UAE. Very good opportunity for us to be able to share our thoughts with you. It was our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you to the audience, everyone who tuned in today, who watched, who listened and commented. I want to offer our thanks to all of the staff, interns, and volunteers who make up the Folklife Festival team. It really takes a village around here. 
Uh, particular thanks are due to Kathy Fung, Michelle Bambling, Pablo Molinero Martinez, Arlene Reininger, Betty Belenis, Laurel Rand Lewis, Elisa Huff, Sarah Rothman, Ginny Maycock, and Diane Nutting uh, for all their behind the scenes efforts. And a special shout out to Justine Bowe of the Smithsonian's Migratory Bird Center at the National Zoo. Thank you, everyone. So this is the last day of our Beyond the Mall programming, but we have a lots more digital programs in store for you. So please follow us on social media to get notifications about our future events. One of those is later this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern time, we are bringing Sister Fire Song Talk with three fantastic artists sharing their music and discussing their activism. So thank you audience for being with us during these last few weeks. And don't forget that if you have missed any programs, uh, our dance party, native foods, incredible live concerts, whatever it was, you can view the videos here where you're watching now or on our website, again, festival.si.edu. We're gonna close this session with a recording of bird song from the Cafe Mesa de los Santos farm. So let that set the tone for the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> Thank you everyone and take care. Thank you too. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. This is the field where your next cup of coffee grows. This is your daily cup of coffee contributing to conservation. The new way of drinking coffee is bird-friendly Habitat Coffee Mesa de los Santos, and it is certified by the Smithsonian Institute. This is the future of coffee, but you can drink it now. Order now on Amazon.com and contribute to restore nature one cup at a time.